there's still a lot of major transitions that we need to make in the field of climate science. We need to align an understanding of climate impacts much more with our understanding of economic outcomes, of social outcomes. Uh, so there's, there's a lot more to do. 50 years, the golden anniversary, a major milestone for a marriage, a career, or even a research institute. The Climate Change Institute at the University of Maine celebrates that achievement this year. But as Paul Majewski, its director, notes, the work is far from over and is changing and evolving along with the Earth's climate system. I'm Ron Lisnett, and this is the Maine Question Podcast. Back in 1972, it had a name that didn't exactly roll off the tongue, the Institute for Quaternary Studies. What was known about the Earth's climate back then was vastly different, as were the tools and methods scientists used to study how those natural systems functioned. It was thought that changes in the polar regions had little or no effect on major human populations, that they were just too far away to cause harm, and that any changes that might take place were far into the future. Today, the research has shown that is not the case. Wildfires, droughts, sea level rise, record heat waves make headlines just about every day. The toll those events take on our planet's health, the wildlife, and human population is on the rise. At the CCI, as it's known, they explore those issues and many more. They drill and recover ice cores to document past climate change, or use lake and ocean sediments from the seafloor to do the same. Those are just a few of the techniques CCI researchers use as they explore all seven continents. The human dimensions of these changes is another major area of research. On the occasion of the 50th anniversary, we take a look back and a look ahead at this work with Majewski. He provides some historical perspective. Then in the second part of our episode, we take a look at the human dimensions of climate change with Cindy Eisenhower and Dan Sandweiss from the Anthropology Department, who also work with the CCI. Our question for this week, what does the past and future look like for UMaine's Climate Change Institute? Well, Paul, thank you so much for taking the time to, to talk to us. A uh, 50-year milestone, as we can see on the poster here, right. is certainly a major one. Can you just talk about uh, that milestone and what it says about where the CCI has been and, and where it's going? We're very proud of the fact that uh, the Climate Change Institute, formerly the Institute for Quaternary Studies, has gotten to its 50th anniversary. We have every expectation we're going to go for many more decades. But I think in particular, uh, it is a great tribute to our founding director, Harold W. Borns. He really did an amazing job of figuring out how to have a research institute well embedded in academia, which is something that doesn't always work that terribly well. Clearly, research institutes are, are related to education. We provide many opportunities for graduate students. We support graduate students. We embed them in research. Uh, we have laboratories that we've built that they work in. They, in most cases, get their degrees in academic units. So finding a good way for academic units and a research institute to function together, work this long together, is quite remarkable. I've seen many places where this has not happened. So talk about some of the mileposts that have happened along the way, uh, both for the Institute and, and maybe, you know, things that have happened out in the greater scientific world, like the Clean Air Act or uh, the discovery of abrupt climate change or figuring out the role that these huge ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica play. What, what are some of the, the major high points or significant uh, findings over that span, do you think? Fifty years ago, I was involved in the field as a, as a student. Uh, so I've been privileged enough to see a lot of transition. Uh, the field of climate science really didn't exist the way we think about it today. Uh, we were mostly under the impression that climate operated slowly, that the polar regions were fascinating places that literally were so far away that they had no impact on anybody. In the last 50 years, a lot has changed. We have, we've had Earth Day, of course, the discovery that there are toxic substances that we put into the atmosphere. The Institute has had an immense amount to do with that. 
we have also seen dramatic changes in the extent of glaciers all over the world. The Institute has had a major impact in those discoveries. We've learned that the climate can change as fast as a political cycle, uh, which is particularly important because if you assume that the climate operates slowly, which it was assumed uh, prior to about early 1990s, that means that if you put greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, they're not going to do anything. That's absolutely not the case. We know that today. Uh, the impacts of climate uh, change, not just greenhouse gases, no doubt one of the most important, but pollution in the atmosphere. Seven million people a year die prematurely as a consequence of poor air quality. And then once, of course, in the last few years, we all realize that climate change is so important, arguably the most critical security issue of, the, of our century, the 21st century. Uh, there, we need to understand the impacts better. We need to understand how we'll mitigate these things, how we'll adapt, and also some of the very positive changes that can occur as a consequence of this understanding and the solutions. And the Institute has been significantly involved in all of those aspects. So the major environmental events, uh, for lack of a better term, that, that we see now, uh, wildfires, uh, floods, rising sea level, uh, droughts, those, uh, are those worse than was thought back when the Institute began, and are they getting bigger sooner? Is that uh, one of the discoveries that unfortunately is being made right now? Absolutely. The fact that we are now subject, as a consequence of warming the planet, to more extremes in the weather system and more extremes in climate, which of course is weather integrated over many, many months and, and some years. Uh, and that means that predicting the future becomes even harder. Predicting climate uh, up until about 20, 30 years ago uh, was relatively, I shouldn't say easy, but you could assume that things would be more or less the way they had been for the last 20 to 30 years. That's no longer the case. Things are changing very quickly. And the Institute has been heavily involved in discovering this, understanding it. Uh, we've developed software that allows people to see these changes in data in beautiful graphic form. We've developed software uh, that allows people to see how their air quality, uh, in some cases, has gotten worse. And in the case of legislation, uh, which is Di which is uh, directly impacting uh, pollutants in the atmosphere, how in fact that has been effective uh, and in cleaning up our atmosphere and of course our health and ecosystem health. Two major initiatives, I guess you could call them, that the Climate Change Institute has started, 10 Green and Climate Reanalyzer. Give us the, the Reader's Digest version of what those, uh, what those two things are all about. We're very proud of two pieces of publicly available software that we've developed. One of them uh, deals with understanding what one's air quality is like. That's called 10 Green. That was a collaboration between uh, the Garand uh, Corporation, which is an advertising firm in Portland. They helped us to understand how we could make this understandable to the public. Uh, the purpose of 10 Green was to show people how much we know about the chemistry of the atmosphere and what the health impacts is where they live uh, so that they would become energized and activated in, uh, in, in, in pushing for cleaner and cleaner air. Uh, and the other one is Climate Reanalyzer, which has been primarily uh, the, the work of Sean Burkle uh, in our institute, who's also the main site climatologist. And that is, I can say it unabashedly, the very best uh, publicly available uh, software that allows one on any platform, a smartphone, a fancy computer, no matter what, uh, to understand today's weather and to go into the past, look at the recorded record and understand what the changes are. Uh, also look at models that predict what will happen in the future, look at the impact of volcanic events, on and on and on. You can teach yourself climatology using climate reanalysis. We get 2,000 to 3,000 hits a day. 
It appears in media regularly, particularly print media, because the graphics are so beautiful. And it's utilized by the public, by researchers, by government uh, on a regular basis to understand where we are today uh, and to do something that the Institute is dedicated to, and that is provide perspective about climate and environmental change. So speaking about that, uh, one uh, phrase or term that you uh, you taught me is plausible scenario planning. Mm -hmm. where, where are you now in terms of being able to do that and, and try to predict what, what might happen? That's sort of what that's all about, right? Yes. Uh, I'll back up a little bit and say that uh, in general, the way uh, prediction for climate operate is to assume what will happen by 2100 and then sort of see a linear path in that direction. That's not the way the climate operates. It goes up and down and we know that there are fast abrupt uh, climate changes. The other thing that's very important to understand about climate change is that it's not just physical science, chemical science. There are a lot of disciplines involved. It's, uh, as a consequence, it's, a, it's an interdisciplinary problem. I had the great privilege of co-teaching a course uh, with John Mann, who was in the business school, and he taught me what plausible scenario planning is. Businesses use it, military use it. It is a way in which you look at the full range of potential changes in the future uh, and then try to, it, in particular in the short term, for the next few years, which is, of course, what we care about immediately. A and then you look at the way in which one either mitigates adapts to or helps to uh, make something better uh, out of what will happen. And the answer is whatever is the win-win situation for the largest number of plausible scenarios, and typically you can pick five. One of them can be the most conservative approach that nothing is going to happen, which has not turned out to be true. Right. Uh, the other is the more extreme. Uh, it's a way in which you get people talking together. Uh, in which you represent all views, and you revisit it on a regular basis every couple of years and update it. It's, uh, it, it is a clear uh, signal to all of us that uh, everything that we do is not along a linear path. There are a lot of directions that we can take, and climate is a complicated uh, I'm not saying it's so complicated that we can't understand where to go, but it has a lot of moving parts, and plausible scenario planning is a way in which one can take into account and adjust to an understanding of these changes. So you have the perspective of this whole 50-year span. Can you just reflect back on, I don't know, the tools that you used back when you were starting out in 1972 or so, uh, and everything from the clothing. I mean, hopefully you can keep warmer now than you did back then. Uh, but the, the, the tools and implements you used back then versus now, has that come a long way? It's unbelievably different, except in the case of clothing in some ways. Uh, in Well, I, if you go back to the 1930s, the clothing that people wore who do the sort of things that we do is largely wool. Uh, by the 1960s and 70s, we had made the uh, transition into synthetic materials, which, it, as it turns out, don't keep you warm, don't keep you uh, dry. And now we're back to wool, uh, mixed with a little bit of perhaps synthetic. Uh, that's a remarkable turnaround, and, and an awful lot of camping uh, features, too. However, when you look at science, it's a completely different game. I'd say that most of us who were involved in this sort of field uh, 50 years ago, it was primarily a pencil, a piece of paper, a compass, and maybe a hammer or an ice axe. Uh, today, it's very, very different. You still need all those things. You, it is absolutely essential, and we're very proud of this, uh, to get people into the field to understand where data comes from. But there are so many ways of approaching this data. Remote sensing, uh, drones, uh, analytical techniques that uh, would have been absolutely impossible to imagine. I take one example that we have pioneered, and that is the ability to uh, increase dramatically the sampling of ice cores. Ice cores have remarkable records of past environment, past climate captured in them. The very best that has been done 
until recently was about 100 sample levels per meter. So that's uh, uh, one centimeter resolution. We can now do 10,000 uh, yeah. of these samples per meter, which has tremendous implications. It means that we can extend records. We can literally look at weather scale, uh, not just a, a year or a few years. Uh, and then there are all sorts of other uh, analytical improvements, uh, data handling improvements, of course, ability to access scientific papers, synthesize things. It's a remarkable world. And the in fact, the whole way that we deliver education is very different than it was before because students have access to information that in the past you'd have to go to the library, uh, maybe order by interlibrary loan, be lucky if you can get a Xerox copy, and now everything is at our fingertips. There are downsides. Not everything that's at your fingertips is correct. Uh, you need to be a better synthesizer, a better understander of information than we probably were in the past. So as you pass this milestone here, what's next? What projects are on the horizon that uh, excite you or that you'd like to see the Institute uh, dig into? The, the Institute, uh, I, I'm very proud of the fact that our Institute has evolved with the field. Uh, we have in the last few years, because of partnerships with the School of Policy and International Affairs, the Business School, the Law School, really begun to delve into things that are extremely important to scientists, but that scientists don't necessarily have expertise in. You can make a discovery. That's great. You can be involved in, a, in an amazing film, uh, award-winning film, that demonstrates the importance of that. But actually getting people to understand it, uh, getting it into policy and law uh, is non-trivial, and then getting people to react to it. And those are the things that we have worked really hard in the last few years uh, to become involved in. There are many other things that the Institute is, has its foot into but needs to uh, more firmly step into. That includes uh, how one takes large amounts of data and synthesizes it. Uh, and I include in this remote sensing and satellite data, how we find new ways of taking uh, records, sediment records, ice core records uh, that we have in storage, and in many cases that are disappearing very fast, how we take those uh, before they're completely lost and understand even more about our past, how we compare our understanding of the past uh, and couple it our climate under and environmental understanding, how we couple that with historical events. Uh, and for example, pandemics, uh, the impact of war uh, on the atmosphere, these things go on and on. And when you start to look at even the outer fringes of what we're beginning to talk about right now, uh, places like the Arctic, which are changing rapidly, a new ocean is appearing. And how do we deal with these things? Uh, from a geopolitical point of view. Uh, the, we have models like the Antarctic Treaty, uh, which have preserved Antarctica for scientific and now tourist involvement, which is great. Uh, it's too late to do that easily for the Arctic, but how do we take those lessons learned, uh, which were critically important? Scientific achievements could not have gotten to the stage that they're in now if we hadn't been able to work together in places and solve problems together internationally in a multi and interdisciplinary way. So there's still a lot of major transitions that we need to make in the field of climate science and in many other uh, major challenges like climate. We need to align an understanding of climate impacts much more with our understanding of economic outcomes, of social outcomes. Uh, so there's, there's a lot more to do. And uh, while people might have thought 20 or 30 years ago that we knew everything we needed to know, uh, and some people today even assume, well, it's going to get warmer by 2100. We just have to live with it. There's a lot more to learn about how we move along in that direction, what the impacts are, and there are a lot of great opportunities out there. There will, without a doubt, be a large portion of Earth's population that will be very badly hurt by continuing climate change. But there are many things uh, that can be done to either soften that, 
ranging from economic to major technological discoveries uh, that will actually make the way we live healthier, less dependent on uh, resources that the world has less and less of. So I have a very bright view of the future, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there won't be uh, some very serious shocks that we experience in the process. Well, thank you so much. And now we're going to have some people join us and talk a little bit more about the human dimensions of climate change. So great. We'll transition to that. Thank you. Cindy, I know we've talked before on, on, on this podcast, maybe just but just remind us what, what is sort of your area of interest? Sure. So as an interdisciplinary institute, the Climate Change uh, Institute has lots of folks working in different areas. We have a social side, so I'm part of that kind of social sciences core. Um, and my work is specifically looking at climate mitigation and adaptation policy. Um, what we can do to help people, for example, here in the, the coast of Maine adapt to climate change um, through things like reuse and um, building resilience for our communities through alternative means of procurement. I'm also particularly interested in mitigation. So what's the mitigation potential of uh, moving away from these linear systems of production, consumption, and disposal? and towards alternative economic arrangements that allow us to cycle um, cycle materials and get rid of all of the emissions that are associated with new production and consumption and disposal. So those are my two primary areas of focus. Now, Dan, we, we, had, we talked to you earlier this season, as a matter of fact, but just to remind us again, what, what's your area of focus? So I'm an archeologist. I've been here for almost 30 years and I was hired jointly into the Institute and in the Anthropology Department. And I work mainly in Western South America, Peru and adjoining countries, and I work on climate change and how it impacted people and also how we can use the archaeological record to track the climate change. Cindy, with hindsight, obviously now we know that uh, changing climate has a huge effect on, on people of today. Was that uh, not so much the case back when uh, the Climate Change Institute started? Uh, what, did it seem like maybe these are problems, but they're a little farther off? I would say that that continued much past 19, the 1970s, uh, you know, even in recent decades, that people saw climate as a threat that was far removed from them personally, either geographically or temporally through time. And um, that is really rapidly changing now, right, where people are experiencing the effects firsthand, they're well documented, and we have people all over the world who are claiming that their livelihoods are in severe danger now um, and that climate change and acting on it quickly is a matter of life and death for them. And um, even here in the United States, where I think it's taken a little bit longer with the wildfires, with flooding, with coastal erosion, uh, all sorts of different issues, we, we certainly are coming closer to that immediate need for response. And, and that's something that's changed. And it's there's there's actually some great social science research on it, that risk is a culturally constructed process and that people in Sweden understand climate risk in a very different way than people in Tuvalu or here in the United States. So um, it's an active area of research uh, in, in the social sciences. And it's an exciting area as well to figure out, you know, who, how can we communicate with different types of people, not only the science, but also think about things like climate obstructionism and what's being done you know, to kind of prevent progress, and then also research on what's going to be the most likely, likely effective policy response, and those are all ongoing. A lot more awareness now. Dan, the peoples you study go back thousands of years. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about the, the push and pull that you've observed in those peoples as they adapt and had to pivot to climate change even back you know, 10,000 years ago? Sure. I'll start by really looking at the field. Archaeologists in the 50s, 60s were pushing back against the idea of environmental determinism along with much of anthropology. And in the late 60s and early 70s, when I started to come into the field, they're beginning, archaeologists were beginning to say, wait a minute, we can see evidence for climate change, for environmental change, and we can see that human reactions seem to track with this. So when I came in, what we were doing was tracking the changes and trying to correlate them directly with what people were doing. Things have come back to a much more balanced perspective now. We realized that people of the past had many successful adaptations to, to these events, which were largely invisible in earlier studies. And we're beginning to look at that now in a very productive way. Some of these adaptations are actually lost, but recoverable and useful in today's world. 
And that's certainly true of peoples in Peru where, for instance, they developed field systems that would be used only during El Nino flood times when the regular canal systems were destroyed so they could still have some agricultural production in these very bad times. That's a very recent discovery that we didn't know anything about five years ago. You talked about the interdisciplinary nature of the Institute. Is that part of what makes, I mean, there's a lot of uh, climate change research centers at universities and other, other places around the world, but is that one of the things that distinguishes UMaine's CCI, the, that interdisciplinary, is that sort of makes it somewhat unique in a way, or? CCI is definitely uh, one of several, and there are more and more, but we were certainly amongst the leaders in terms of interdisciplinary activities. Uh, but we're also, one of the leaders in terms of not just looking at modern climate, uh, but looking at past climate and using that information to make better predict predictions and understanding of how we'll function uh, in the future. We're also different because we work all over the world. Uh, very few climate research units do. Uh, we're also not unique, but different because we're very dedicated to having students involved in all of the things that we do in these unique parts of the world. We're also unique because we have an amazing uh, selection of analytical equipment. We're also relatively unique because we've developed software that nobody else has that allows the public and researchers to understand both physical and chemical climate changes. Cindy, I know uh, it's somewhat, how you look at this whole issue is, is almost 180 degrees from what you hear a lot about in the news where you know there's talk of reducing emissions, reducing burning fossil fuels. You're trying to look at it from the consumer end and the product end and trying to reduce it almost going backwards if, in a way. Is that, is that a fair way to look at it? It is. Um, I, I might say that I do both, but yeah, yeah. They're, they're in the literature there are what are called push strategies and pull, you know, demand and, and uh, pull strategies. And I, I think we need both of them. Um, but what I'm, all, to, all of my work has been, you're right, largely focused on consumption, but consumption not separated from the extraction production distribution it's the it's the linear kind of chain of the entire like materials economy and so um, yeah a lot of the strategies that I've studied including reuse has to do with like how do you prevent that whole linear chain through keeping products in use longer right and, and then you can kind of displace all that those emissions along that whole chain so um, but there I think in terms of policy mitigation policy you you can and we absolutely should be working on both push and pull strategies demand side and supply side strategies uh, to be the most effective so we can certainly work on you know transitioning to alternative energies for our production based activities and we can certainly work on really offsetting the need for virgin production through our um, consumer side policies as well and, and it, it'll be interesting to see kind of what mix we come up with but I think a lot of people don't think about that end user side very much they think well when you've already got a product and it's you know you think trying to figure out what to do with it I don't think that they really associate that much with the ability to mitigate c carbon emissions with what you do with that good so it's right. kind of a fun area to work in and it just it seems like plastic in the ocean I mean that's just it's come into the headlines a lot lately, but is that sort of a, a prime example of what you're talking about? It's just too much stuff. Oh, absolutely. We just have an absolute glut of stuff in our system. And, you know, we can choose to incinerate it. We can choose to throw it in a landfill. And a lot of that waste does end up in our oceans, right? The plastics break down and break down. They get in the water supply and then out to the ocean. Um, or we can choose to figure out ways to repair them, reuse them, resell them, and oftentimes those choices to keep things in, in circulation longer not only have carbon-based benefits, but they also have real, as you and I have talked about before, social and economic benefits for local communities that um, are harder to track and harder to measure, but I think could be argued equally as valuable. Dan, the, the people you study, I mean, nowadays, obviously, consumerism and, and, and the, the, the things we all buy are, you know, through the roof. Was that always, always a problem, but at a smaller scale for some of the ancient civilizations? Not exactly. Where I work in, in Peru, they had no money until the Spaniards arrived. They had trade and redistribution, reciprocal relations. So it was, a, it was a different kind of system. They did have tax. They had labor tax. But if you did it, you were fed and housed when you were doing it. So 
It's a, di a different kind of system. I just want to go back to your question to Paul about interdisciplinarity, though, because I just want to say that the Institute has been a wonderful place to do interdisciplinary work. It's a great framework. The way we're reviewed, we have joint committees. We're essentially rewarded for doing anything anywhere within this broad space of the Institute. If I had done the same things that I've done in a straight anthro department that wasn't associated with an institute like this, I might not have gotten tenure. That doesn't look like anthropology often. But being in the Institute with Joint Review has been incredibly productive. And my closest colleagues have actually been in this building, in the Department of Earth and Climate Sciences, or the School of Earth and Climate Sciences, over these 30 years. It's been a great place. Back in the 70s, first of all, it was not the Climate Change Institute, right? It was the Institute for Quaternary Studies. Mm -hmm. And the word quaternary defi defined means what? Well, it's typically the last 2,000, the uh, 2 million years of Earth history. Uh, but I know that when I came here, I, there were a lot of discussions about, was it really 2 million years? What did it really involve? It's, a, it, it's an open-ended term, number one. And number two, while at the time it really served the Institute well, it's not something that the popular uh, audience understands. It doesn't roll off the tongue. No. <laughs> no. Nobody even knows how to pronounce it. Yeah. Quaternary, quaternary, right. quaternary. Right. And, and it's interesting, when, when I became director and wanted to change the name, I'd only been around about a year, but I found it awkward going around speaking to people and saying I'm from the Institute for Quaternary Studies. It took a while just to explain that. So I went around to almost everybody in the Institute and I talked to them about uh, the change. There was only actually one objection that it would turn out to be a person who wasn't staying anyway, but the person who was the most enthusiastic about the change was the founding director. He was the person I was most concerned about. He said, no, it sounds like a great idea. We should talk about and say what we are. That's the late Hal Borns. Yes. Yeah. So what I was going to ask was, you know, the output of, of the Institute mm -hmm. then, uh, was it merely we found these results and this data and we're putting it out. Now has that evolved to um, address policy and, and be more proactive, I, I guess, is, is, maybe, is that the right word? Well, I think that uh, all of the people and all of the researchers, and I, I include faculty, staff, and, and students in the Institute, understand the immense importance of giving back to society uh, and helping to apply uh, what our findings to society. Uh, so, And that's changed dramatically. I'd say that 20, 25 years ago, in academic environments, it was not con necessarily considered what one does. You don't necessarily try to apply what you do. And when you apply it, it doesn't necessarily have to be something that you discovered about what's going on today. It can be something in the archaeological record. Now it's very different. Funding is based on how you apply what you learn, whether or not it's, a, it's something that's valuable to people. And it's a very important part of the Institute. We do it in several different ways. We have uh, at least once a year a meeting in which we listen to all the graduate students and, and the faculty talk about what, what they do. We, have, uh, we, pro we provide information on our websites. Uh, we all give talks all over the state and all over the world, and we all appear in various forms of media. Probably more media attention to researchers in the Institute than pretty much anything else in, in the region. And as a result, because everything is political now, there's pushback. I mean, do, do you all, have you all experienced sort of people saying, well, that's not right, or, or what have you, that, that kind of um, questioning? I'm sure we all have. Uh, it was far more intense a few years ago. Uh, actually, I welcomed it because I think having skeptics is a valuable thing. It makes you look at what you're doing uh, more intently. In the last few years, however, the skeptics have run out of steam. Uh, they tried to run climate change into a very narrow path that was easy to attack, which means, you know, what how, how important could one degree, two degree centigrade rise be by 2100? But it's, it's, it's much more than that. It's much more than that temperature. It's much more than just uh, what's going to happen by 2100. And uh, one way or another, people are beginning to understand that. Uh, but it requires individual discussions with people. Because if you live on the coast, it's one thing. If you live inland, if you live in a place where water is not available, if you live in a place that, where the sea level is rising, so we've had to, I would say, be very nimble in the way we speak to people and make sure that they understand that the application of climate, the understanding of climate change is really, is relevant to them. 
Cindy, in, in some ways, I mean, when you advocate for some of the things you're talking about, it's, it would save people money, so they, they, they probably welcome that news, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I don't find too much pushback against my own work um, yeah. because it's, I guess in some ways, tangentially related to the climate science. But I did want to bring up, I do think that the climate skeptic community is shifting very quickly. So two quick things I'll mention. One is that um, there is this big initiative around the five Americas, that there are these kind of five different audiences that understand climate in very different ways. And the climate deniers, their numbers have gone down substantially recently. And they're, the number of who, who would consider climate alarmed, so people that are really concerned about it, are going up rather significantly. I'm also part of a, a network called the Climate Social Science Network, and just heard a really great presentation last week from a scholar who had analyzed for over a 20 year period, all of the reports put out by cli climate skeptic think tanks. And it used to be that their claim was this is that the science isn't reliable or there's something wrong with the science. And those types of claims are going down substantially, they're dropping off. And instead, where they're creating doubt is whether or not the solutions will work. And so now we see all sorts of claims that no, that no, it's not going to work to go to electric cars because the grid can't handle it. Oh no, it's not going to work to you know transition to alternative fuels because it'll be too expensive. And so um, that would make sense with Paul's observation that the skeptics aren't attacking the science as much because it's really hard to do at this point, right? There's right. such a strong consensus. So uh, I was looking through the, the wonderful brochure that was put out for the 50th, and, and one thing I noticed, uh, Sean Burkle, who is one of your colleagues, um, he, he has looked at climate change in Maine, and I was looking at some of the numbers. Temperature has risen in, over the last century, three degrees, uh, six inches of uh, precipitation increase over that time span, and the sea level has ri risen over seven inches. Are those akin, Dan, to anything that you sort of witnessed with some of the populations that you studied in Peru? Or is, is this, is this uh, what we've been dealing with all along here, or is this an order of magnitude worse? It depends on how far back you go. If you go back before about 7,000 years ago, sea level was rising a lot. It went up over maybe 10,000 years, a little bit more, went up 120 meters. And people had to deal with that. They were, they were there for much of it, and they had to move. And of course, a lot of the sites are underwater, so it's hard to track exactly what they did. And temperatures changed, but they, things weren't going in this single direction the way they're going now. And of course, we didn't have the volume of people, the density of people we have. It's a lot easier if you're mobile hunter-gatherer bands with small populations. You simply vote with your feet. You go somewhere else. But in our society, where are we going to go? How are we going to feed people? It's, it's a much more serious problem. Even small changes, and they're not small, are much more serious now. Cindy, for the, the changes we're talking about here, I mean, that has real effects on people in Maine. I mean, that, that they have to alter or, you know, really pivot um, how they live, right? Oh, absolutely. And, and we've, you know, we've, Mainers are resilient. We know that. But we've got examples all over the state of people that are working really hard to try to figure out what they're going to do, given what we know about their, their, their likely future, right, under a kind of likely climate scenario. And it's everything from trying to figure out what to do when your working waterfront is flooded or trying to figure out what to do when your culverts are too small to handle the amount of flood water that you're going to have coming through and, you know, roads that are blocked, you know, that don't allow people to escape. Um, all sorts of problems with rural communities and services uh, that can be provided there and insurance and all sorts of things that people are really having to work through. Um, and it's going to be tough, but I do think, yeah, as I said, Mainers are resilient and the state has done a really nice job of starting to put forward an infrastructure and a system. Uh, the Maine Community Resilience Partnership is, is excellent and the Maine Climate Adaptation Providers Network, we've got some resources really coalescing around our um, main climate future action plan and so um, you know hopefully communities will continue to make those investments and get the help that they need to to adapt to the changes that are coming we are locked into some change and so um, you know the more that we can do to plan for that in advance and, and make sure that those plans are equitable and effective the better so as we pass this milestone maybe I'm going to ask all of you what what's next what uh, how will the work of the CCI evolve what sort of areas are is it going to be um, you know, more work along the lines that has happened? Are new areas going to be explored? Uh, any predictions for the hundredth? <laughs> or at least maybe the next five years? What are your thoughts, Paul? 
Well, as I, as I mentioned earlier, we, we need to constantly evolve. Uh, I think an awful lot of things that have happened to society uh, in terms of climate and environmental change have been surprises. They've been, they shouldn't be surprises because we actually did it, uh, but we didn't realize that we were doing it. So clearly we need to be a lot smarter about the surprises that we might encounter. And those surprises include things like abrupt climate change, fast shifts, uh, which even the models don't take into account, but which we just experienced and will experience more of. Uh, the, the fact that uh, our society in Maine could change dramatically, I, I believe that within the next couple of decades the population of Maine will double. Uh, and if it does, it has tremendous impact on schools, roads, everything else. Uh, and it's important to be planning for those things. And now that uh, Maine is uh, in some ways lucky, we have a small population now, a large area makes us very attractive in terms of climate change. We potentially have a much more stable, although everything is unstable, relatively more stable uh, climate uh, future. Uh, but we need to think about what could happen. We need to look at the full range of plausible scenarios for the future. Uh, and we don't know what those are yet. We know what the range potentially is. So the Climate Change Institute needs to be smart enough to think about those things, attract the right sort of people and projects to do it. And we need to be pushing more in the direction of uh, policy and legislation because all of the things that we have all found, uh, if you can eventually turn them into policy and legislation, will get us on the right track. Cindy, how about you? Areas that you hope to delve into or a uh, prediction if you were so bold? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I do, I do see, you know, our last strategic plan really did put an emphasis on, on policy and I, I, I also think that we will continue to engage in local adaptation efforts and to try to, you know, train our students to contribute to that type of planning and adaptation. Um, which will be really important. We have some wonderful faculty that are very engaged already. Um, and so I, I see that as an important area going forward to, to train students how to do this adaptation work. Um, the other piece is that we are, um, you, you made this year is going to the climate negotiations as an official delegation for the first time this year. And that provides a great opportunity to, to engage our students in that international negotiation process and potentially even create leaders for the future coming out of this institute that can help lead those negotiations or contribute to them in some way. And so I, I hope that that's a, an area we can continue to work on. As we record this, you're headed to Egypt for the climate yeah. summit, right? Yes, a two week climate summit. I'll be there for the first week and we have um, five other faculty, four other faculty and four students uh, going to represent the University of Maine. So it, it will be great and represent the Climate Change Institute there as well. We have some great tools that uh, folks at the climate negotiations are always really happy to learn about, particularly the Climate Reanalyzer, which is kind of an internationally known tool that lots of folks around the world use. It's, it's really valuable. So um, we, we promote that there as well. And it's, it's been really useful for a lot of folks. Dan, how about you? What, what do you see? I think you know, from the archaeology side, we're going to work more and more on seeing how people adapted to climate change in the past and see if there are lessons that we can draw forward. It looks like there are. I could add two other things. Uh, I think there are two big um, goals that we should set for ourselves. We need to be able to generate more large programs like the Arctic System Science Program that we have right now for graduate students. Uh, because in that particular case, the intention, of course, is to focus primarily on the Arctic impacts of the Arctic on Maine, but it brings together people from different disciplines. And when you get a group of uh, people, particularly researchers, interested in solving a problem and you can find a good common problem for them, your chances are much, much greater, far more exciting. Everybody, in terms of what they do themselves, accelerates dramatically. And, and there's a name for that. It's uh, interdisciplinary problem solving. It's a new program that we're trying to get started uh, through the University of Maine system. Uh, and we don't all, no matter how much interdisciplinary research we do, we don't all necessarily understand all the methodologies, all the approaches, all the interactions. Uh, and I think we need, as an institute, as a university, and as a university system, we need to think much more about how we bring our students and the researchers, scholars together to think about what is a complex problem, how do you solve it, uh, and 
how is that actually uh, going to be important for the future. Great. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, as always, for tuning us in. You can find all of our episodes on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, UMaine's Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube pages, as well as Audible and Amazon. Questions or comments? Get in touch at mainquestion at maine.edu. This is Ryan Lisnett. We'll catch you next time on The Main Question.